Charleston, South Carolina, consistently voted one of the world's best cities and top travel destinations? <laughs> it's no secret Charleston floods, but it's the thankfully rare occurrences of storm surge that comes in with tropical storms and hurricanes, or the relatively common stormwater flooding when rain falls at rates and quantities that exceed the limited capacity of our drainage systems or the ever-increasing instances of tidal flooding, when the water levels in Charleston Harbor get higher than that of our lowest roads and properties, and salt water begins to inundate our city. This is not a beautiful canal in the Netherlands. And those are not gigantic houseboats. Maybe they should be. This is Lockwood Drive, a major transportation corridor on the western side of downtown Charleston. And this is a common occurrence. In fact, it's becoming a lot more common. We now have over 100 years of data on the water levels in Charleston Harbor, and the rate of increase in tidal flooding is alarming. In the past four years, we have seen 245 tidal floods in Charleston Harbor. That's more tidal flooding than we saw in the first 69 years of records combined. The rate of increase in major tidal floods, these are tidal floods that get a foot above flood stage or deeper, is even more eye-opening. Since 2015, we've seen 26 major tidal floods in Charleston Harbor. Prior to 2015, we had only ever seen 14. 65% of all major tidal flooding has occurred in the last seven years. I began documenting flooding in Charleston through photography in 2015. Photos like these are important to engineers like me. It helps us validate models we build to simulate this flooding so we can design solutions to mitigate the impacts. But I've learned two other important aspects of these photos. First, they serve as a call to action. The impacts of sea level rise are here. If you don't live in low-lying coastal communities like Charleston, or more specifically the low-lying areas of these communities, you likely don't realize how often and impactful these can be. They rarely make national news. The second important aspect of these photos is to document what the flooding looks like in our city. How are we responding? How are we interacting with it? You see, it's through my background as an engineer, coupled with my observations in making these photographs, that I believe we can try to save the Charleston we love, but it's not gonna look like the Charleston we know. There's no moonshot infrastructure project we can invest in that's going to magically make us more resilient to flooding. It's going to take solutions inspired by nature. It's going to take solutions built of concrete. It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take tough decisions. And it's going to take a lot of money. But we have a solid set of plans, a foundation from which to build. We have examples from other places, things that have already been built. We have creativity and ingenuity, and we have a love for this city. So we have to try. Today, I want to present three concepts that together are key to making Charleston more resilient to the water that's here and the water that's coming. This is a map of downtown Charleston today located on a peninsula of land where, as the historic saying goes, the Ashley and Cooper Rivers meet to form the Atlantic Ocean. Charleston has always had a proud relationship with water, but it's also a complicated one. The green areas you see on this map are the original high ground of the Charleston Peninsula. As the city grew, we took land from the water, often filling these creek beds with superficial materials that have subsided. These areas are our lowest and most flood vulnerable in the city. Like the intersection of King and Yuji Street, located in what was the upper reaches of New Market Creek, one of the first intersections to flood during moderate to heavy rainfall. Or the intersection of President and Line Street, located in what was the heart of Gadsden Creek, which regularly floods during both rainfall and tidal floods. And yes, ironically, Sometimes even Water Street. Water Street. This map again shows the historic creek footprints of the peninsula 
but it also shows the areas of the city that are vulnerable to inundation from up to five feet of sea level rise. It's as if Mother Nature is reclaiming what was once hers, taking the creeks back. But these creeks hold a key solution to sustainably managing water in our city. You see, when it rains, water flows downhill, gravity, and it floods these lowest areas first. When the tides come up, again, it floods these lowest areas first. We need to look for ways to reestablish some of the functionality of these creeks. And in some cases, that could mean retreating from these areas and allowing the creeks to reform. But I think when you consider the density that we've built on top of them, that's going to be a difficult proposition. So we need to look for ways to incorporate the water into our urban landscape. This is a park in the Zoho Resilience District in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. There's a basketball court here, there's a school nearby. This is an asset to the community. But it's lowered, so during times of heavy rain, when the park's not going to be used anyways, it fills with water and prevents that water from running off and overwhelming the downstream system. Here in the States, on a larger scale in Atlanta, Georgia, is historic Fourth Ward Park. This park, in conjunction with the Atlanta Beltline, is a huge asset for the Atlanta community, but it's designed to flood when it rains. If you take solutions like these and imagine them in these old creek beds, I think we can start to see how we can make water an asset in these areas instead of a liability. It's going to require sacrifice. We may have to relocate some homes or elevate some homes. We'll probably have to expand our park system so we have large areas that can store meaningful volumes of water. And we may have to rethink how we access homes on some of these streets if we allow them to flood more often or perhaps always. But by making water and bringing it to the surface and making it an asset in these areas, we can strengthen the communities here while making them more flood resilient. The second concept is being debated in cities up and down the East Coast and probably around the world, from Miami to Charleston to New York, and that's perimeter protection, or building a system around our city to protect us from the impacts of sea level rise and potential storm surge. Now, when you look at this map, approximately 45% of the peninsula is vulnerable to that inundation from five feet of sea level rise. And unless we're willing to have meaningful conversations about retreating from these areas, I think there's a strong economic case to be made that some sort of perimeter protection is needed. But what should it look like? I don't think we have to go far for inspiration. The Charleston Battery, it's a seawall, but it's so much more than that. This is iconic Charleston. This is a world-class linear park. And when you start looking at the areas of the peninsula that would probably need perimeter protection, you can start to envision potentially eight miles of world-class waterfront park. I get excited about that. Yes, it's going to require sacrifice. We're going to lose our views of the beautiful Ashley River as we drive down Lockwood Drive. But think of the new ways this will allow us to connect to the water. Think of the ways this will change our relationship to the water. Think of the ways that this will strengthen the Charleston community while protecting us from flooding. And it doesn't always have to look like a wall. It's hard to tell what this is in this photo, but that's kind of the point. This is a levee system that was built on the North Sea coast of the Netherlands to protect against storm surge from the North Sea. But by incorporating nature-inspired sand dunes, there's environmental and flood benefits. And believe it or not, there are 700 parking spaces in this structure. So in the peak summer months, when there's heavy traffic, this alleviates that traffic and parking issues in this coastal town, strengthening the quality of life and the economy for the city. As we invest in major flood infrastructure, we need to make sure that it provides multiple benefits, that it strengthens our communities, it strengthens our economy, and it improves our quality of life. Wow. And finally, we need to look for ways to slow and store water in our own properties and neighborhoods. You see, when it rains on our impervious surfaces like our roofs, and our driveways and our streets, that water can run off of our neighborhoods in quantities that can overwhelm our drainage systems. We need to look for ways to slow and store that water. Perhaps next time you replace your roof, you could look at installing a green roof instead of a traditional roof, or installing rain barrels or cisterns to collect the water and prevent it from running off downstream. Perhaps you could look at replacing your driveway with a system that allows water to infiltrate instead of running off, and look for ways to incorporate and store water in your yards and lawns through rain gardens and things like that. 
The city of Charleston has a program called Rainproof Charleston. It's modeled after a similar program in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And it provides resources and tools so people like you and me can install and implement solutions like these on our own properties in our neighborhoods. But it also encourages us to work with our neighbors so that we make our, our neighborhoods more resilient and part of a resilient stormwater system. So not only would we be improving our flood conditions, but we'd be strengthening our communities. There's a lot of water here, and there's more coming. And it's going to take us all acting individually and collectively as a community to make Charleston more resilient to it. But by respecting our natural landscape, making water an asset instead of a liability, by engaging in the design process of the major flood infrastructure we're going to invest in to ensure that it strengthens our communities, improves our quality of life, and strengthens our economies, and by looking for ways to slow and store water in our own neighborhoods, we can make Charleston more resilient. We can try to save the Charleston we love by adapting the Charleston we know. Thank you.